Hi, everyone, and welcome to our weekly broadcast. We call it Chance Talk. I'm joined by Sam Savage today, and as always, we are live. So this is your opportunity to say hello in the comments. If you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn, we'll see your comments um, in our studio. And uh, ask questions, uh, suggest topics for conversations. We do have some things to discuss on our agenda. Um, but if you have any ideas or thoughts, you know, feel free, don't feel shy. This is why we do it, so we can interact with your comments. It's much more fun when you ask uh, questions. Um, Sam, any, any first quick starting words before I, I share some of my recent traveling no, no, stories? No, no, you, you, you've been on the road going to risk conferences, and, and you did come up with a wonderful concept that I will let you <laughs> introduce today, <laughs> that I think has, has real legs here. So uh, why don't you tell us no, where you've been, what you've done, and... Uh, Continue Thanks, th 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 thanks Sam. Uh, so over the last couple of weeks, I've been um, to a risk event in Frankfurt and then a couple of risk events in uh, in Dubai. And, and what I've kind of been observing, which it, it always piles on together and it kind of fits into this you know, nice piece of you know, pieces of puzzle and it suddenly all fits together. And, and so the two things. First, we started with this uh, webcast with Sam uh, to break down the risk management myths, we called it, uh, or sorry, we, I borrowed the name from the list that Sam and Doug Hubbard created called the lame excuses. So we continued calling them the lame excuses. And I think I've just stumbled upon on the lamest excuse of them all, like the mother of all the lame, uh, la lame excuses. Because every time I would have a conversation about quantifying some uncertainty to support a decision or to to fix a certain problem, inevitably, there would be somebody who would come up with this kind of monster mother excuse. Uh, and it just continues to happen in physical events or virtual conversations that I'm having on LinkedIn. And, and so this is the this is the lame excuse. And let me know if you if you've come across that in the comments as well. Uh, the lamest excuses, whenever you're discussing some sort of risk quantification, the implication behind the story is usually that there is a problem, a specific problem. There's no, there's no kind of risk analysis in the vacuum. There's usually a specific problem and you're trying to use risk analysis to solve that specific uh, problem. And then inevitably somebody comes up and goes, this approach is bad because it doesn't solve some other obscure problem. And you're saying, but it wasn't designed to solve the other obscure problem. I'm I'm talking about this problem A that I'm trying to I'm set out to solve, and I'm using risk analysis to solve that. And Eric, uh, thank you for commenting. I think this is kind of this is this is pretty much a, a, an example of um, a, an argument that people use. So I would say, you know, we we can estimate expected losses and unexpected losses, you know, using some very basic, you know, quantitative risk register. And by the way, Sam, uh, three years ago, I think you did a little webcast with me, uh, literally going step by step on how to turn any risk register on the planet into a quantitative risk register, basically replacing, you know, probabilities with Bernoulli's or Poisson's and replacing the consequences with uh, perts or triangulars and, you know, multiplying together, generating the the loss exceedance curve. So that risk, the quantitative risk register, is it has a very narrow application. It's only useful if you need to estimate expected losses and if you need to estimate unexpected losses. And that's pretty much it. Like there's there's nothing more you can squeeze out from a quantitative risk register. It has a quite a limited application. And yet somebody would always come in. Uh, usually on the, on, on the you know, white horse and shiny armor, would say, but what about predicting the, um, the date when the, the war between Russia and Ukraine finishes? <laughs> and right. I'm going, what does this have to do with anything? Right. Right. <laughs> what does it have to do with anything? Because we're solving problem A, and you just came up with the most obscure problem Z, uh, by the way, ironic because, you know, Russian aggressors oh, call yes. themselves dead. <laughs> I don't know. Subconsciously, I kind of came up with it. So you came up with this problem Z and you say, 
So this is bad because it doesn't solve some obscure problem. And so I, I tried and summarize. Or, or even or even just an irrelevant problem. I, I, exactly. I, I, I mean, when you say, you know, it's like showing someone addition with numbers. Yes. yes. Well, it doesn't solve division. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> For that, we use division. <laughs> You, and yes, and somehow, I think you've just came up with the best analogy because I was trying to think of analogies and I, I really couldn't come up with a, 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 oh. a, better, a better one. Uh, well, but it, it is it is that crazy. So, so look, 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 look. There, there is so much that relates to arithmetic. There is so much, because we're doing the arithmetic of uncertainty, right? And a team and I are currently looking at how the state of California models the risks of the power utilities and how, how the power utilities have to report that risk and stuff. And it it's so much, in so many of my discussions, I go back to dice, right? And such pushback. You know, oh no, that, that's too simplistic. And, and the analogy I use uh, in the my chancification book, I, I, I have a chapter. I'm not sure we've discussed it. The chapter is the customer is always wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so one of the examples is we're going back to the arithmetic analogy. Company calls me up and says, "Well, we want you to sign an NDA." Why? And let us imagine for a moment that I'm teaching them arithmetic. I'm not teaching them the arithmetic of uncertainty. We want you to sign an M We want you to sign an NDA. Why? We need help multiplying two big numbers together and we have to show them to you. And I say, well, you know, I could like sort of teach you multiplication. I wouldn't even have to see your numbers. I don't want to sign an NDA. Yeah. And then we, the discussion goes on and I say, do you know how to add one plus one? And they say, you idiot, that's too simplistic. We need to multiply two large. I say, yeah, but do you actually know how to add one plus one? Well, no, we told you that's too simplistic. We want to multiply two big numbers together. That's the end of that relationship, right? Or, 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 or here's another one. I'm consulting to a railroad that wants to convert to an airline. And they come to me and they say, okay, we want you to get the locomotive to fly first, and then we'll get all the rest of the train cars to fly individually. <laughs> okay, so much for that. The misconception is so huge. It starts with the word risk. Risk is in the eye of the beholder. I've said this a hundred times. Is there a risk that IBM stock will go down tomorrow? Heck no, I've shorted IBM. The risk for me is it goes up. Oh, you're long on IBM, Alex? Risk for you is it goes, okay. Or another way, an airplane flies over a forest and drops a pair of dice into the forest. Is there uncertainty? By the way, there's no one there to see it. There's no one in the <laughs> forest to see the dice land, right? Is there uncertainty? Yeah. <laughs> the dice can... Is there risk? No. <laughs> there's no. If you haven't bet on the dice and there's someone to observe, there is no risk. And, and it starts at that utterly basic level. And then as you say, they go on to, oh... <laughs> The risk of yeah, it, it, it's like it's like a competition to come up with the most obscure event uh, that would somehow dissolve the whole logic of um, quantifying uncertainty. Um, so, so I I try to kind of link it to the, this concept that I've been uh, pushing for quite a long time, and uh, I call I call it horses for courses which I think is a British or an Australian saying, and in US you just say, well, the, the, best, the best tool for the Use job. the right tool for the job. Right tool for the job. Is that depending on whatever problem you're solving, for, for example, in credit risk, you may only be concerned about expected losses and unexpected losses. In um, uh, environmental risk, you would be concerned about the uh, worst case scenario, the plausible worst case scenario. In uh, insurance cases, you would be concerned about plausible worst case scenario as well as expected losses. Basically, 
different problems require different outputs and a diff different precision or accuracy from uh, from the risk analysis. So I wouldn't never I would never use a risk register for uh, insurance purposes. But I, I am more than happy to use a risk register, obviously quantitative risk register, quantitative risk register for uh, for budgeting, high level budgeting, budget adjustments, uh, and so on. So there are different types of problems that require different kinds of analysis. And just like in in banking, and I, I very much like this analogy with Basel, um, in banking, there are three levels of risk analysis. There is basic where it's like super high level, like almost kindergarten, like dummy, dummy calculations. It's like you know, take your revenue for the last three years, average it and multiply it by 15%. That's your kind of that's your risk. It obviously, has nothing to do with reality, but it's a very rough, high-level estimate. If you don't have anything, then they kind of they say, well, you know, just just use this. And, and the trouble with basic is that it significantly overestimates or underestimates risks. Usually, overestimates. And since in banking you have to pay for the risks you take, you keep. Uh, it's actually quite bad business to overestimate your risk. So the regulator, you have to keep extra capital, right? Exactly. So the regulator is kind of saying, I'm fine if you are lazy and you don't want to do any risk analysis, you just pay for it. And, and so that's basic approach. It's, uh, it, it's bad business, but it, it does have a place in, in regulation. And a quantitative risk register is basic risk analysis and it's just that it significantly overestimates underestimates probably overestimates your your actual risk exposure and you can't really use it for anything anything serious but if you have got nothing you might as well start there and then in basil they have two other levels which is standardized and advanced and basically every step in 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 the ladder you go from basic to standardized to advanced. Every step in the ladder significantly increases the amount of effort required, and it makes your estimate of the underlying risks more realistic. And so, supposedly, you pay the fair price and not over overpay for the for the risks you keep. Uh, so, so in my mind, I think this is a very important idea for the for the risk community to test and validate and see if it kind of if it sticks there are basically you know, four levels of risk analysis there is you know, qualitative which is not risk analysis it's just astrology horoscopes and then there is basic standardized and advanced and if you have a problem where the consequences are great and the cost um, at hand is significant. For example, um, for, for example, in our insurance, when we knew we needed to save millions of dollars, we actually built advanced tailor-made models. And thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mark, for the uh, for the comments. Um, Mark is saying he loves our passion and for and, and keeps spreading the word. Uh, so uh, whenever we could save a lot of money, we actually went ahead and built tailor-made specific models for that problem, uh, which targeted the elements of the problem that were important. So we needed to understand what was the worst case scenario. We needed to understand uh, what are the controls that may reduce the, the, the likelihood of those catastrophic events. We needed to work on the tail. Completely different math to your risk register, completely different model, completely different methodology. Still, risk analysis just kind of tailor made for uh, for that uh, for that problem. Well, well, I want to I want to um, comment on this a bit. So, as we're starting out, I think I think I I follow that, but I'm, I want to push back in the following sense. Remember, we're starting at the beginning where people are just engaged in sort of garbage activities. Yes. Do you want me to share your screen or not yet? No, I don't need to do it yet. Okay. I want to go back to when Fibonacci introduced Hindu Arabic numerals 
to Europe in 1199. So I want to say, relative to these different tools, there's really one tool that I'm going to call the arithmetic of uncertainty, right? And one of the dangers people get into is, I'm going to do it again with arithmetic, because it's a good analogy. Fibonacci lands in Italy in 1199. I mean, he, he was from Italy, but he studied math with the Arabs in Algeria. And, you know, he comes back, he says... I've got this great new way to communicate and calculate numbers. And 85% of the population says, what's a number? But the banking regulators and the accountants know. And so, so he's showing them stuff. And so, you know, he shows a turnip farmer. You can take three turnips and add them to two turnips and get five turnips, right? And the eggplant farmer says, Oh, I wish I grew turnips. I have eggplants. And Fibonacci says, actually, you can add three eggplants to two eggplants and get five eggplants. And everybody says, Fibonacci is an agricultural genius. And then he goes to the generals. And he says, you know, you can add three trebuchets to two trebuchets and get five trebuchets. And they say, oh, my God, Fibonacci is a military genius. <laughs> no, he was just using arithmetic. And so what I want to mention is another purpose for risk management, which I may be even the most important in my book, that it teaches you how to think about risk modeling, right? You have to do it. One reason to ride a bicycle is it will teach you how to ride a bicycle. You can't do it by studying the differential equations of motion of a bicycle. You can't do it that way. Um, and so I realize now, talking about risk registers and everything, I do have something to share. And this model was developed many moons ago uh, with my colleague, Matt, colleague Matthew Rafelson, who is now uh, both uh, helping me with a nonprofit and um, my consulting uh, organization. So let's let's share the screen. This is the this is the quantitative heat map, right? What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that in fact is correct about heat maps the famous heat map that you know people consider worse than useless and they are as they come out of <laughs> come from the factory but it got one thing right it has the correct axes it has an impact axis along <laughs> you know the horizontal and it has a probability axis on the vertical oh my god you've got the right axes <laughs> for a probability distribution and in fact, you could then lay an exceedance curve out over the heat map, okay? Now I'm gonna keep going on this in a second, but one of the things, let's, let's go back to the give me a number, right? Mm -hmm. which, which is the root of all evil. And just to remind everybody, in the chance age, when the boss says, give me a number, you say, what do you want it to be, boss? Here are your chances, okay? And so we've discussed this as well. Keep the uncertainty alive. Don't turn it into a number. So, well, how do I do that? I have to make decisions. So one of the things that I learned from Doug Hubbard is, and I can show that in a, in a different uh, example in a second, but if, if we look here, let, let's look at this black line as th this, by the way, is an, called an exceedance curve. So, okay, $20 million. What's the chance that our losses will exceed $20 million? I go up to that line and, oh, it looks like about 38%. Okay. What's the chance it'll exceed, uh, you know, like $11 million? Oh, that's about 98%. And I don't know if Doug made it up or where he got it, but the organization also has a a tolerance for risk 
and you can draw the risk tolerance graph over this exceedance graph. I love this idea. You've got the whole distribution. And then you will discover places where the where the risk tolerance is below this graph. You say, oh, we got a problem there. We can't live with that. We can live with it wherever it's above. But back to this thing. So here I have individual risk over on the on the left. And and if we look, um, oh, one sec, Alex. I, I, I want to uh, fire up my magnifying glass. That's what I need here. Forgot to start it up this morning. Okay. Sure, no problem. So now we're back here. Okay. So let me zoom in a little bit. And so, so he, here's another very general concept about building integrated risk models. You have a bunch of different risks. And I, I sort of like to think of these as trees in the forest because this could happen or that could happen or the other thing could happen. And then you have global economic stress factors or other or geopolitical or whatever. I like to think of those as the winds of fortune that blow through the forest and tie everything together, right? And um, so after looking at the 10 lame excuses that Doug and I came up with for not quantifying uncertainty, uh, John Button of Gartner came up with an 11th one, which, which is, oh yeah, we combine all these things together, it just turns into a big normal distribution, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, not when there are winds of fortune, <laughs> like GDP, <laughs> for gosh sakes, or unemployment, <laughs> you know, or, or discount rate. So these things up here are the winds of fortune that blow through the entire sort of decision for us. And, and we have, in this case, we've got three scenarios, good, bad, and ugly. And those are the chances of those things happening. Now, when I look down here, um, let's see, uh, what I have, I, I model each, in this case, it just shows you can, you can integrate these models with each risk. I've got kind of a simple linear model that says risk one, if I think of it as like a, a three-dimensional regression, risk one is intercept plus slope with GDP times whatever GDP happens to be plus slope of unemployment times whatever unemployment happens to be plus slope of interest rate times whatever it turns out to be plus a standard error of 2.5. And then over here, I have like a, uh, I have a threshold that I don't want to exceed. And impact <laughs> threshold. Mm -hmm. So now I actually have a quantitative heat map right here, which tells me the, for these different risks, the relative likelihoods that they will exceed my threshold. So look, this guy is bright red. The impact threshold is zero. There's a 99% chance this will exceed zero. If I raise that to two, let's raise it to, to six. And suddenly that risk goes away if I want to live with that. But now, meanwhile, out in this big thing here, let me, this is, this is the first risk, risk one. Risk one is this blue guy. What would happen if I put a big slope on unemployment? This one goes down for some reason as GDP 
Oh yeah, no wait. Sure. GDP goes goes up. This risk goes down, right? That's not too surprising, right? <laughs> yeah. What well, what would happen if it went up with GDP? Let's put a 50 in there instead. Okay. Then the the numbers change over here. We we've, we've got a risk of GDP um going going down right so anyway i as i control all these let's do it again let's 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 add up add something with unemployment on this one and and again here we've modeled the risks with these winds of fortune as discrete but let's now um add with this one let's put in a 50 there with unemployment see what happens okay and let's observe this graph over here. So control Z, control Y, right? This is like a thousand trials or something. You see the blue one move, but we can add them together. When we add them together, we get the black one. And sure, you can keep your heat map on there if you define this right, so that you actually see the chances of being in various places. And the last thing we have down here is um oh it's called a, a scatterlation matrix i i think matthew must have made up that word um what we see is that we have a positive correlation between risk one and risk two that could be bad we've got quite a negative one with risk one and risk four which means they hedge each other somewhat right um so anyway just um, back to your risk register. Yeah, you can keep a risk register and you can make it quantitative and you can tie it to other risks in the register. Absolutely. And it's going to change the way you think. And that's the ultimate goal here. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I very much like this um, example because this is the type of risk register you would build if somebody asked you how would three macro drivers the gdp unemployment and inflation affect our risk exposure and what is the probability of each of the risks and collectively exceeding a threshold so depending on what the frame for the problem is that really kind of the ultimate driver for the actual design of the uh, of the of, of the risk model in this case uh, quantitative uh, quantitative risk register and, and and here's something else you can do with the model what i say is the models teach you about risk modeling the way bicycles teach you about riding bicycles okay and so people will say oh well let, let, let's look at risk two, by the way. Let's zoom in on risk two. What is risk two sensitive to? So risk two seems to be very sensitive to unemployment. All right, right there. And we've got a threshold of two and a 97% chance of, of uh, exceeding it. So people come in and they say, well, you just pulled all those numbers out of your butt. You, you really have no idea what these are going to be. And because we've got these three economic scenarios, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And man, in the ugly, um, we've got a 10% unemployment rate. So when they say you have no idea what these numbers are, you say, okay, so... What do you think it is? What do, what do you think the chance of good and bad is? Let's find out. What, what if good were, were, were um, let's see, let me go up by, what if, what if good were 40%? Just type in 40%. Um, and then notice over here, that drop, it's too small to see that one from 97 down to 95. What, what, if, what if good were, 60 percent oh. what if good were 60 percent
this is still a real risk, right? And then uh, you can <clears throat> you can say, well, would you be willing to live with three per, with a with a threshold of three? It's down to eighty-one. This is still a big risk, but we can let them put in their probabilities and do what if. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, I want to reiterate, when we started this whole thing at Royal Dutch Shell with their portfolios of exploration projects, people two steps below the CEO were clicking in Excel and using the mouse. And so the, the issue here, let, here, let, let's reduce, that's good, let's reduce bad, okay? Uh, so, so bad now goes down to... Um, 25%. Um, this guy can go up to 75 and then we'll have no ugly, no chance of ugly. Finally, I'm getting that number down to 78%. But when you allow the decision maker <clears throat> to test the model for directional correct correctness, they begin to learn to ride the bicycle. I cannot overemphasize it. You can't, you could not do this in the age of mainframe computers. It took very fast PCs, having interactive models with graphical interfaces. It's the only way you're going to get them to buy in. Yep. yep. And just to kind of illustrate the lame excuse, the, the mother of all lame excuses. So somebody would come in and say something like, this is not going to work because foreign exchange is not there and you right. can't test for foreign exchange. It's just another obscure macro factor that was excluded for some reason. And, and to that, you, you, your, your response is, well, it wasn't designed for foreign exchange. If, and if suddenly foreign exchange becomes an issue, then there's no problem redesigning the model. Or add foreign exchange. Come on. Exactly. I'd have to insert a column and add for an exchange, right? Yeah. So, but that's another reason why the models need to be small. That is the whole idea. You're, you don't want a model that looks like a sandcastle. You want a model that looks like Lego blocks, right? You've got to be able to add that in there very quickly. The other thing though is engaging the manager right it i just keep coming back to to bicycles the another in, in, in my chapter on the on the uh, customer's always wrong okay here's a customer they want me to teach them how to ride a bicycle right everybody we're gonna ride bicycles well what do we do we watch movies on bicycle tours we buy very expensive bicycles we buy very expensive bicycle outfits do we ever get on a bicycle Heavens no. And by the way, in dealing with management, with the very top management, you don't put them on the bicycle with everyone else watching as they fall off. You actually need to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. What you've got to do what you've got to do is desensitize them to PTSD, post-traumatic statistics disorder. You have to you have to poke fun at statisticians in, in a way. You have to give them the intuitive understanding. I, I cannot tell you the number of people who've said to me, you know, when I show when I, when I show the dice simulation. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I, I just I'm telling you, everything you need to understand about risk management and be understood with dice. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, if you roll a die, this is my most important model. You know, if you roll a die, click, okay. Equal chance of getting all the numbers one through six. When you roll two dice, when you add two dice together, you get more sevens than anything else. Holy Toledo. There are people who see this and say, 
why didn't they teach me this in statistics? And by the way, I mean, they are teaching this in like fifth grade in schools now, thank God. But if you don't understand this or, or, or another one, what if, what if I have the maximum? Of, and by the way, let, here, let's just take a look. You know, the, the average, the average of the sum of two dice is seven. The, the average of one die is three and a half. But what about, what about the maximum of two dice? Well, first of all, the shape is that. Oh, and the average is 4.47. This is the, you know, another example of the strong form of the flaw of averages. This is like adding one plus one. If people don't want to look at the dice, oh, no, this is too simplistic. Oh, well, then you know what the, oh, you know what the maximum of two dice looks like then, do you? What's the average of the maximum of two dice? You know the average of one dot. I mean, so th the other thing about it is, a as a consultant, there aren't that many consultants who can give a money-back guarantee. I give a money-back guarantee on Jensen's inequality and the central limit theorem if they are applied according to specifications, okay? If you don't know those things, if you don't know the bare bones of the arithmetic of uncertainty, I don't care what kind of risk models you have, right? Very true. Uh, which, which has been, which has been quite a challenge, and I think you, know, you basically you, you're saying there are you know, two simple criteria for determining if um, if you know if this conversation is kind of worth having. If the recipient understands uh, the central th um, theorem and the Jensen's inequality, then they can probably appreciate and they'll mo most likely appreciate what you're trying to to teach them. If they don't, it will be very difficult. Now, the unfortunate reality, I think, of our risk profession is that 95% of the people out there with the title risk manager do not understand those two things. Oh, well, well, no, no, but I mean, that's, but they can be taught. That they can be taught. But you have to do that in the first, you've got, I think, maybe five minutes <laughs> to teach them that they don't know what they don't know, right? That's what you got to do, right? And that's why we got, we got the statistician drowning in the river. That gets a laugh. You, oh, first you have to get them to laugh. Oh my God. Most important thing is to get them to laugh. Then you got their attention. Then quick. And I got this, the, the, the drunk in the middle of the road. You got the, the, the chance of the 10 tasks that I always use. I mean, that, that, um, I don't know if we have people on who, who, if you haven't seen that one, let, let me just make sure. Just, yeah, just uh, watch the risk awareness um, session with Sam, where you uh, showed it. Let's see. it. It's a very nice illustration on how something that seems intuitive right is actually completely missing the point. Um, let's see. Oh. Ah. I, I, so I don't know. Let me see. Well, okay, okay. This it, it, it's it's good enough. We 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 have a project, and these are four things that have to be done before we can go live with something, right? And of course, we don't go live until the last one is done. That's the maximum. Okay, right, and. But on average, each of these takes 10 days. And so basically, folks, what's the chance we've done in 10 days? Well, most people get this way wrong. If each, pro if each task had a 50-50 chance of being greater or less than 10 days, then it's like flipping four heads in a row. That's one chance in 16 you'll be done in 10 days. And that just is such an eye opener. And, and of course, you know, we, I show the statistician who drowns in the river that's on average three feet deep. I show 
the drunk wandering down the middle of the highway whose average position is the center line. And of course, he's dead, even though at his average position. Is, these are, I can do these in my sleep as well. And, and that's important. So James Taylor, the, the, the singer, once said that you need, for crowd control, you need something you could sing if a lion were eating your leg off. So I can do these in my sleep, which means actually I am asleep, but I'm, or that, the part of my brain that's doing this is asleep, which means the rest of the brain is listening to what people are doing, watching their eyebrows, right? And getting them engaged. So b- back to these top level managers, they're the ones you need to get. Oh yeah, and we're, we're sort of out of time. We never discussed, we'll Ooh, do this next time. Good. My yeah. little triangular thing. Yeah. But, but, you need to get to the top decision makers. You need to get to them alone. When people ask me, well, who do you need to see in the organization to get the ball rolling? I say, I need to see the people who don't have time to see me. Yep. And what will the purpose of your meeting be? To get another meeting. <laughs> As lo- Look, when I was a folk singer in crowded bars, What are you trying to accomplish? You're trying to get the background noise to go down because probably what happens when you start to play and sing is that you're now interfering with the conversations, the noise will go up. You're mm-hmm. focused on making the room quiet. I am focused on talking to the person who doesn't have time to see me and what am I gonna get them to do? Laugh. Then. That will hopefully set up another, but I get them to understand that they don't understand and there's more to, to be done. Um, and the world is new. Technology has allowed this. It is not. Alex, there's no way that 20 years ago, even with that risk and crystal ball, that we could have done this stuff. With, with Shell in 2006, we could barely do it. We couldn't do it in native Excel. And, you know, we used Dan Feilster's wonderful, you know, analytic solver stuff from Frontline. But that's a different piece of software you have to learn. Today, we can just plain do it in Excel. We just have a billion potential users. Yeah, exactly. It opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, so a lot for us to discuss in the next uh, webcast. I know you have to run. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes uh, if there Thanks. are uh, questions. And um, th- th- thanks, Sam. Um, any topics, any suggestions, any um, items or examples or case studies you want us to talk about next week? Now is your chance to write in the comments. Thanks, Mark and Eric, for being proactive and uh, uh, commenting. Everybody else who's watching, I know there are dozens uh, of you, I think 20 or 30 people are watching uh, live and uh, and another 100 or so will watch and replay. Um, Feel free to ask questions or make comments. Don't feel shy. Thanks, Sam. I'll see you at the next session. Okay. Any questions, any thoughts on what we talked about today? Oh, on that, um, the ultimate lamest excuse, by the way, I do have a new article published on Risk Academy blog. And if you want to read the kind of more detailed uh, mathematical explanation of it, um, by all means, visit the blog. Uh, it's very easy to find. Just Google Risk Academy and Risk Academy blog, dot blog is the, the address. And it's uh, one of the more recent uh, recent articles. This replay will be available on the Risk Academy YouTube channel. So if you go YouTube slash at Risk Academy, one word, it will take you to the uh, to the channel. Uh, if you are watching this on the channel, don't forget to subscribe, um, like, you can become one of the members to get access to risk awareness uh, workshops earlier than everybody else and to other training videos. 
If no more questions, thank you everyone and we'll see you next week.